It's a very difficult. <laughs> Welcome to The Rational Egoist. I'm your host, Michael Leibowitz. For years now, I've been arguing with people about the unconstitutionality of both federal immigration laws and the federal war on drugs. And I've done so because nowhere in the enumerated powers in Article 1, Section 8 is Congress given authority to legislate in such matters. But alas, I'm just some schmuck who's read a few books. My guest today, on the other hand, is a legal scholar who's written on subjects from property law to law and economics to classical liberalism. He's also the Lawrence A. Tisch Professor of Law at New York University. He's Professor Richard Epstein. Professor Epstein, welcome to The Rational Egoist. Well, I'm nice to be here. It's an absolute pleasure and honor to have you. So first of all, I think we need to discuss constitutional interpretation because the way someone interprets the Constitution often gives the result that they're they're going to get. So my from my perspective, I'm a, an originalist, meaning not that I delve into the intent of the people who wrote it, but the original meaning in the document as understood by the people at that time. So what are your thoughts on originalism? Well, it's probably the biggest and hottest topic in constitutional law. And it turns out that what you say is a perfectly sensible question, how it is that you interpret the written text, but it is not a theory which gives you a comprehensive view of how you think about the Constitution. Uh, the first thing about originalism and textualism is peer as hard as you can at the text. There will be concepts that are absolutely rife and all pervasive in constitutional law, which have no textual reference whatsoever. So if you go back to the 19th century, and ask how everybody started to think about this subject. Uh, what happened is, generally speaking, they had a notion that the constitutional limitations in the police power were the central way of understanding what the Constitution was about. Uh, the words police power nowhere appear anywhere in the Constitution. Uh, starting in the as early as 1825 or so, and then after the Civil War accelerating, the notion of the police power became to say that any kind of individual rights that any individual person has is subject to an implied right limitation by the state, given it's a power to affect the health, safety, uh, those words you kind of understand, um, general welfare and morals of the population. And so the first question you have to ask is, where do you get that uh, from the Constitution if you're a textualist? And you don't. Uh, what you have to do in order to understand that is to say, when you start looking at the various kinds of protections in the Constitution, uh, what you discover is that they create presumptions, but not absolutes. And so then what you have to do is you say, well, I have freedom of speech. Well, what does that mean? And somebody comes up to you, does that mean I can incite to riot? Does it mean that I can engage in fraud? Does it mean that I can breach confidentiality, for example, and so forth? And everybody says, no, no, no. And they're all right about that. Well, how do you do that? Well, if you think about a dispute between two private parties, and one of them claims freedom of speech at the time he defames another person, saying false things about him that cost him a marriage or a job, everybody says you can't do that. So the secret, I think, of understanding how the Constitution works is to be able to import into the doctrine the standard defenses to all of the particular perspective rights in the Constitution, i.e. freedom of speech, freedom of religion, freedom of contract, and all stuff like that. And that's a project that takes you very quickly into non-textual areas. So that's the first problem that you start to add. Second problem that you start to add is that you have to deal with the question of mistake in the way in which you put things together. And it turns out that if you look at the original constitution and the originalists start to talk about it, what they always do is they put those particular portions of the initial constitution um, which they regard as utterly sound and which have been systematically disregarded. Uh, so if you're a good originalist, the first clause you're going to hit is the commerce power, because what it says is Congress shall have the power to regulate commerce with foreign nations among the several states and with the Indian tribe. And by the time you get to the New Deal revolution, it turns out that interstate commerce now includes feeding your own cow and to your own cows. And people start to giggle when they hear that. I remember when I explained this to a whole variety of people, they just laughed. They said, you can't be there. I said, no, it actually has gone that particular way. And they said, well, how did this happen? Um, if you're an originalist, because you look at the term commerce, 
what you do is you read it as follows. It, commerce itself uh, does not include manufacture and does not include consumption. It includes mainly production and transportation of goods uh, one way or another. They trade and so forth. Um, uh, the I phrase is used in connection with foreign governments and Indian tribe and intercourse that is exchange and transportation and navigation fit that. And what we do is we go way far beyond that. And why do we do it? Because in the New Deal, we thought one of the proper functions of government was to create cartels uh, for your preferred clientele. And the only way you could do that was to expand the commerce power. And if you go back and read the case, uh, the reason why they regulated feeding your own corn to your own cows uh, was that they had understood that if you allowed that to happen, you could not have price supports with respect to agricultural goods because uh, firms would start to merge. So that if I was a dairy farmer and you turned out to be a cattle grower, we would put our businesses together so we didn't have to sell to one another and therefore could escape the prohibition. That's what this case was about. And you know, once you understand that, then you realize What's really driving this is the founders essentially had a view of the Constitution in which they use central power in order to facilitate commerce amongst the several states by supposedly unclogging the arteries of exchange, removing state barriers. And these new guys essentially are trying to put into set a system of cartels for agriculture, for motor vehicles, for labor and everything else. And they had to change the meaning. OK, I understand that. I've written that. I agree with that. But now you get to some other kinds of problems. Like, for example, I take the single question, does the Supreme Court have the final authority to declare statutes unconstitutional, right? Marbury and Madison. Well, the answer is no, if you're careful about the Constitution. The Supreme Court was a body like every other body, and they regarded it not as an ultimate arbiter, but as something that was essentially subject to the checks and balances of other branches of government. And here are two that really matter. One is that you know the Supreme Court... Um, can remove the appellate jurisdiction of the uh, Supreme, rather the Congress could remove the appellate jurisdiction of the Supreme Court anytime it wanted to do so. That's just not in, not consistent with the view that, well, this is the body that can tell Congress, Congress that its statutes are unconstitutional. How could you do that if, in fact, they can say you're not allowed to talk about these things? What Marbury and Madison was about after um, Justice Marshall misread the appropriate statute was how it is that the Supreme Court exercised its own jurisdiction, organized its powers. And essentially, that's a very coherent notion uh, that Congress could not force upon the Supreme Court the duty to hear cases that do not fall within its constitutional jurisdiction. It doesn't have to boss anybody else around it, just refuses to hear the cases. And that's surely what all this stuff was around. And then what Marshall did was to get to the issue is he misread a statute, section 13 of the Judiciary Act, to make Make it appear as though it could issue free-floating andamuses when in fact if you read the full statute it was perfectly clear that mandamus was a writ that could only be exercised as auxiliary of and supportive of uh, the other jurisdictions of the Supreme Court. So the statute was perfectly good. Uh, so that's one thing. And then the question is what about if state courts decide to override a federal statute? If you look at the supremacy clause it says oh that's the law of the land but you have to read the second clause, uh, which says, and the judges in every state are bound to interpret it. Well, this is designed to give the state courts a check on federal law. And you know they thought this was very important at the time. It became very clear very soon. It's absolutely suicidal. Uh, these doctrines are not self-explanatory. Two states are going to get different interpretation. There's nobody left to resolve it. Uh, so in a case called Martin against Hunter's Lessee, Justice Story, who is an ardent nationalist, he tried so hard to explain why it is that the Supreme Court under Section 25 of the Judiciary Act had the power to review state court decisions that denied the constitutionality of various laws. He was just wrong in terms of reading the text. So now you get these two cases there. Now you ask an originalist, are you going to undo Marbury and Madison? And are you going to undo Martin and Hunter Slessy? And everybody looks at you boggle-eyed because people have come to understand that these two doctrines are so heavily embedded in the shape of American constitutional law that 200 years after the deed has happened, to try to reverse them will put this nation into utter chaos because we all our institutions are embodied. So when I wrote my book on the classical liberal constitution, I said, originalism has to understand that there's this very difficult problem called the prescriptive constitution. Uh, prescription is a practice whereby the continuous 
exercise of a given wrong creates a right. So if I keep walking across your land, it's a trespass for 20 years when the statute of limitations run, all of a sudden I have a protected easement, right? And what we do is we always have this provision, not so much because of the individual case, but because the only way we can have stability of expectation is to prevent people bringing frivolous charges about previous easements, right? Um, 50 years, 75 years after it began. So it's a very kind of odd thing. And, you know, we all sort of accept that. And we do exactly the same thing in constitutional law. So if there's been a long and consistent exercise of power in one fashion or another, that seems to be benevolent, uh, an important qualification, that solves certain very dear problems, nobody's going to go back on it, whether they're an originalist or anything else. So to give you another illustration, the Electoral College was supposed to be a deliberative body in each of the several states of the Union. Absolute chaos if you try to put that into place. And so what we did is we developed a convention that they were bound slaves, that is, they were messengers. Uh, once the state legislature declared how the election had come out in that state, the only thing that the electors did was to transmit it. You don't need a person to do that, right? You could do that by the post. Uh, but we realized that having deliberative bodies override electoral majorities was so disastrous after the 1800 election that we essentially completely changed the practice. This happens all the time. So now when you start getting to something like immigration, uh, your position, Michael, is that there's no power of immigration in the Constitution, right? That is my position. But first, I, I'm going to challenge you a little bit on, on, <laughs> your, on your interpretation of originalism and on your uh, interpretation that the Supreme Court originally didn't have the power to, to strike down unconstitutional statutes passed by Congress. <laughs> mm -hmm. In the Constitutional Convention debates, I believe it was Governor Morris who ascribed that power and said, of course, they'll have that power to overturn unconstitutional statutes. Madison as well, I believe, agreed with that. In the Federalist Papers, Hamilton said that, and that was arguing, you're making the argument to the nation that they should adopt the Constitution. And Hamilton argued that the judicial review was a thing, that the Supreme Court had the right to overturn unconstitutional statutes. And I've heard it argued by Randy Barnett and others going back to the 1800s that it included in the judicial power, it was understood that they would have the power to overturn unconstitutional statutes. So how do you get around that? Well, I mean, first of all, the first thing you have to do is to worry about the tension between the text on the one hand and the rhetorical excesses or statements that are made with respect to it. These are selected. They're by some people. They may not represent the situation of the whole. If you were to look at a contract and ask what its terms mean, how much weight would you give to the fact that one side after the fact um, basically says, we think it means this, and the other side says nothing at all? Generally speaking, you don't allow that stuff to come in because it's too unreliable. Uh, second point is you actually looked at the structure. You have to explain the provisions associated with the supremacy clause and the limitations that the Congress has on the creation of the appellate power of the Supreme Court. If you go back to look at all the earlier cases, virtually every single one of them uh, was a case in which the legislature tried to force the courts to take things that were beyond its jurisdiction. Uh, Philip Hamburger wrote a long book about it, which is similar in its tone to what Randy Barnett said, you go back and you read the cases, each and every one of them is a case where the court says, look, here's a body which has only has the power to deal with cases in dispute up to 10 pounds. And what the state legislature decides to do is to make it 15 pounds. Well, they can't do that. And the court will just have to repel it. And remember, you don't need to enforce the remedy because all they're going to do is not hear the case. The genius of Marbury and Madison as a case is it was not a case in which what he had to do was to force the legislature to agree with him, right? What the case said, in effect, I'm just not going to deliver the commission. And if we're not going to order you to do something, right? Under these circumstances, what's the legend? What are the other guys supposed to do? They say, oh, well, you, you try to order us and we're going to resist. So it was only by the time you got to the second court and you get to Jackson that you actually see uh, the real tension over this question of external power. And in fact, historically, it was only resolved very reluctantly, I might add, in Cooper v. Aaron, which was 1955, and only in connection with racial segregation, where essentially 
what really happened in that case is Eisenhower was very reluctant to interfere on his own. Remember, the mood on racial differences in the United States in 1955 was very different from what it is today, right? Sure. And he thought the judicial order was a form of protection that made it easier for him to do his job. And so what you often did is you had a kind of a collusive situation where the court I wanted to order the president to do it, and the president was all too eager to be ordered. So this is the exact opposite of Jackson spinning fire. And the result of that was Charge Attorney, who was his attorney general, ended up on the Supreme Court. And after that, we get Dred Scott, and the rest is history and so forth. So I, I think the answer is those things are all plausible, uh, but not there. In fact, Madison said all sorts of crazy things. At one <laughs> point, he really did. He did want to have a veto, but he wanted to have this basically the federal government at the legislative level, the Congress have a veto over all state laws. Um, and so then when I ask you, okay, if you do this, you're doing this, uh, Justice Scalia had this famous maxim, right? Uh, everybody loves to quote it. Uh, you don't find elephants in mouse holes, right? Well, let me put it this way. If you're saying the judicial power includes the power uh, to declare laws unconstitutional, um, what you really are doing is saying a very large elephant into a very small cause. Now, it turns out the judicial power is misunderstood. Um, another one of the great mistakes in interpretation of the Constitution is it says the judicial power shall extend to all cases in law and equity, right? So do you know what the last phrase in equity means? Most people just don't pay the slightest attention. Equity, as far as I know, means injustice, that if there's not, and if I might be wrong, it's been a long time, but if there's not an explicit statute to governing a situation that they would judge according to justice, am I wrong about that? Oh, yes, in both, in so many different ways. Okay. Uh, it's instructive. Uh, the first thing is there is something known as the equity of a statute. Okay. Uh, but this is exactly the opposite. It means that there are certain cases that are covered by the statutes and other cases that are so close to it by way of resemblance that in order to prevent circumvention of the major command, what we do is we stop this artifice under the equity of the statute. So it okay. had nothing to do with justice and so forth. It had to do with a major problem of law enforcement, which is the issue of invasion uh, that has from particular commands. So I, I, I do this on too many talk shows, so forgive me, audience, but uh, here's an illustration of how this works involving my grandson, Noah, at age three. Uh, he's getting around and he starts, to, starts punching people. And I said, no, you can't hit anybody. You know what he does? He gives a sly grin and he kicks me. Um, you get the point, right? I said, you can't hit. I didn't say you can't kick, right? <laughs> so if you had a statute which said, thou shalt not hit, are you going to read it to allow kicking? Well, that actually brings me to, it's going to bring me into the immigration part. From what I could gather, I, I read a, a rather long article you wrote on constitutional interpretation. So I knew yeah. you were an originalist. Exactly. But yeah, it, what, what, hard, what you it, do is, is you, you reason by analogy. And that was actually a good example. By analogy, you would extend and say, well, clearly what is meant when you say don't hit, kicking is included, even yeah. if it's not explicitly stated. So you can extend the power of the court by analogy or extend the power of a statute by analogy. So my question to you is, because I still say that under either method of interpretation, immigration laws would be unconstitutional. The reason being, first of all, I think they violate the spirit upon which the country was founded, where all men have the rights to life, liberty, and pursuit of um, happiness. Mm -hmm. Uh, the very fact that the founders didn't seem to be concerned at all about it, it passing laws to prevent immigrants from coming into the country. The only reason they gave them the power of naturalization was because they were afraid of foreigners getting elected to office that would then be able to have influence from a foreign government. And when the subject arose in the debates about a possibility of barring foreigners it was rejected out of hand. And when the Alien and Sedition Acts were passed, there was an uproar. So from my perspective, whether you're reasoning by analogy or going by specific text, immigration laws would be unconstitutional. Am I wrong? Why or why not? Under either method, originalism or yours. On, on the question that you give, you're absolutely right. But you ignore the prescriptive constitution and the complications that are associated with okay. that. 
Um, so what really happened is uh, the, the Constitution has what Justice Jackson called great silences, areas in which they may have thought about it and decided not to recognize or to do anything about it or where they just didn't look at it. So the most famous illustration of that is who has the power to recognize a foreign government in international affairs. Does that power rely in the president or does it lie with respect to the Congress? There was a case called Zubatovsky. I don't know if you've heard about it about no, seven years ago. It was a, it, a true, it, it's a simple set of facts and therefore it's the greatest possible case. Uh, there was this Jewish couple um, who had a child born in Jerusalem and they wanted to put on his birthplace. This child was born in Jerusalem, Israel. Okay. Now it turns out them's a fighting words uh, because there are large numbers of people in the world who think that Jerusalem is not part of Israel. It has to be subject to some kind of international negotiation. And there was this huge fight as to whether or not the Congress could authorize that on the statute or whether the president and his power to run foreign affairs had the control over this. And the first thing you do is you start looking at the document and there's absolutely nothing in it that tells you who is to decide what recognition is to be given to foreign states. It's just a complete blank. So then you say, okay, well, nobody can do it. Well, you can't run a country without having international relation. And so uh, there's the big battle as to whether or not Congress, if it speaks, um, has presumptive power, or whether the president, including his power to recognize ambassadors can do this. And Hamilton took both sides of that issue. He said in the beginning, he said, well, uh, the power to uh, receive ambassadors means they present you the credentials, you just take them in. And then the later Hamilton says, hey, two guys present me credentials and they're inconsistent. I have to decide which ones to accept. This is eerily similar to the debate over how you count ballots in the House of Representatives when there's a challenge to the original thing. And so eventually it became the president had this power, um, it seems, although there's still dissenters against that sort of stuff. And, and so what, the, what you're pointing out with immigration is it's very clear that the whole thing is completely underpowered. That is, you need a more complicated apparatus than the Constitution gives you, and then you start resorting to things. And so what happens with respect to immigration is people start to figure out ways to make it national. Why do they want to make it national? Because they're worried if somebody becomes an, an immigrant who's allowed into state A, uh, they could then become an immigrant that can move from state A to state B because of the huge prohibitions on movements in interstate commerce, people cross state borders and so forth. And so slowly, first they try to do this under the Commerce Clause. Uh, the response to it was, Commerce Clause might have to do with passengers on boats, may. Uh, but it surely has to do with goods and services, goods and things that are shipped by boat, right? Uh, and so there was a big argument that took all the passenger cases in the 1849 or so, where they said the Commerce Club even covered that kind of a thing. And so, uh, but people did, and then slowly but surely, and there were constant assertions of the power, nobody who denied it, nobody who could think of a way in which to leave this to the states and the way in which it might have been originally intended. So the whole thing started to flip over. And at this particular point in time, uh, that flip took place, you know, 150 or more years ago, uh, the prescriptive constitution starts to switch in. And as I mentioned to you, it switches in with respect to the electoral college. Here's another question. Uh, can a corporation sue in federal court if there's no federal question? Well, we now say that these corporations are all citizens of various states. How could a corporation be a citizen? It's, it's, well, it was a fiction. Uh, but by the time this thing was fully established in the 1850s, nobody wanted to stop it. And so what we do is we have two constitutions going side by side. And the prescriptive constitution is much larger than anybody cares to. And so now you go back to the originalists and you say, well, uh, are we going to get it right and make sure that corporations can't bring diversity cases in federal court? Are we going to make it right and have the state, um, various state committees be deliberative bodies when it comes to federal elections and things of that sort? In the electoral college and the answer is no 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 so the problem about the original is, is they pick a set of examples where their case has sort of real intrinsic plausibility and to me i think they're right so uh, take the prescriptive constitution under the um commerce clause this basically was set in stone at the latest by say 1942 1945 all right well that's been around for a long time 80 years 
Um, it's all been illegitimate. Every consequence that's followed from the expansion of jurisdiction only expands the power of cartels and labor unions and rather dangerous organizations of that sort. Um, if somebody asked me, would I strike it down now? I'd say yes, but what I would do is I would not undermine any particular statute that's already in place until the thing expires. So uh, you don't have the National Labor Relations Act, but all collective bargaining agreements will be enforced. And then when they're over, they're just gone. But you know, I can't get anybody to want to go along with that. I mean, I, I understand it because people are just absolutely frightened about the complication. So when you do strike things down after they're prescriptive, it's Plessy v. Ferguson. Remember, it was the law for 58 years. And the reason it got struck down is nobody accepted its legitimacy. That is, there were always consistent opposition to what was a fundamentally evil kind of regime. And mm -hmm. it was a perversion of the police power. Remember, we talked about health and safety, right? Yeah. Do you really think you have to have racial segregation in order to preserve the health of the country? No, I don't. But it appears to me that there's kind of a switch with this and mm -hmm. that it ends up being an argument about utility and oh, what, is, yes. what is the best policy rather than what the Constitution actually allows. And if the Constitution doesn't do what we want it to do, then it it allows for a mechanism by amendment to change it. And it just seems to me that it's dangerous to accept expediency as a reason to go along with something or because a mistake is so embedded into our, our culture of jurisprudence that we just normalize it, especially Professor Epstein. This is my my issue is conservatives, by and large, are the very people who are squawking about originalism we've got to be constrained by our original yeah. documents we've got to adhere to the original interpretation we can't have activist judges but they're big supporters of these immigration laws they don't want immigrants coming into the country but it seems to me they've got a serious problem here because if you go by an originalist interpretation then the the, the congress has no authority to make these laws but if you if you don't and you want to expand the power of Congress and of the court, then the conservatives are are out of their depth again because now they're getting what they don't want. And I just don't want them having it both ways. Well, I agree with you and disagree with you. Um, there's no question that they're two different situations and you lump them together and I would distinguish them. One is you have a court now which is sitting around and it has to decide whether or not they... Congress or the president has the power to forgive student debt, right? And you start looking at the rules on executive orders and so forth, and it's clear that the president's way over his head when he starts to misread a statute and so forth. And I have absolutely no disagreement with you when it comes to trying to consciously do something which you know to be wrong. You can't do it. But the other situation is very different. What we're doing is we're not deciding the court's not deciding to do this it observes that this thing has been done long time ago and at the time that it was done there was nobody who objected and that nobody's objected since that particular time and that the institution turns out to save the country from huge disaster so it's one thing to sort of treat the utility as an abstract notion but you really want to have a situation in which when you get a controversial statute or issue like abortion uh, 26 different state courts can issue opinions on its constitution and the Supreme Court can't intervene. So the position is if somebody has made the mistake and it has continued to operate for a very long period of time, you have to be very cautious about changing it. Doesn't mean that you never change it. Plus, C.B. Ferguson didn't do it. The reason why Roe v. Wade created such a difficulty is the original decision was just plain wrong. Um, and if you go back and you read it, it was very clear that Justice Blackman didn't have any idea of how a constitution was put together. Um, and its relationship to Lochner in New York was very problematic. I don't know if you know this, but when I was a very young scholar, before I was 30, I wrote about Roe v. Wade and its relationship to Lochner. And you, of course, know what Lochner is. It's the decision which upheld the con un which found the unconstitutionality of a state labor law statute, which held that you can only work a maximum of 60 hours a week and 10 hours a day, right? Um, and then you get 
the situation with respect to Roe v. Wade. Well, there's a passage in uh, Lochner, which was written by Justice Holmes in his very famous dissent. And he says, this is a constitution that was meant for people with very fundamentally differing views, and we have to interpret it in that light. Um, and he meant that to say, you and I may disagree, but the Supreme Court will not override the legislature unless it's clearly and manifestly something that is offensive to the tradition and mores of our people. And he says, you can't say that about a maximum hours late. It just doesn't read that way. That's what he said, right? Okay. Now, it comes along with Roe v. Wade. They quote the identical passage from Holmes. Only this time they have it exactly the opposite way. Holmes said, uh, because these things are fundamentally different, we leave them to the legislature. And now Roe v. Wade says, since they're fundamentally different, what we do is we give the power to the individual and make the statutes of every state unconstitutional, right? And remember, uh, if the test is, is a law which is uniformly adopted in the United States, virtually everywhere, utterly inconsistent with the framework of our history, tradition, and mores, the answer is no. So what he does is he quotes an opinion, gets it exactly backwards, and then everything starts to go from there. And, and so what happens is uh, the moral case against abortion in the eyes of some people is frivolous, but in the eyes of other people, it turns out to be deeply powerful and persuasive. I have always tended to be on the anti-abortion side of that debate, just as a matter of abstract you know, intellectual reasoning and so forth. And so when they do this in Roe v. Wade, it's a cheat, right? It's not an originalist opinion, it's an intellectually dishonest opinion, it's an intellectually incoherent opinion, as far as I'm concerned. But the interesting thing, why is it that you don't have the prescriptive constitution as a lock? Because the opposition to that case came down the day it was decided, and it never ceased, right? This is not like figuring out how to get people into the electoral college and so forth. And so the distinction is operative. I mean, if you start looking at these things, you can understand what's going on. Now, the interesting feature is that when Roe v. Wade was decided, there was no federal presence on the abortion issue, right? And so it would mean turning it back to the states, which is what everybody thought. You do this thing 49, 50 years later, it turns out you turn it back to politics, the federal government is going to take the dominant role in this stuff. And there's no question that what happened is this was a political disaster for the Republicans of the worst order. Because essentially there's a very large fraction of people in this United States, particularly highly influential, uh, high professional types, who are relatively liberal on social issues and relatively conservative on business and fiscal ones, right? Right, you see all that stuff. Yeah. Well, what happens is if Roe v. Wade is not on the table, they'll vote their political preferences on the fiscal and financial issue. But if Roe is on the table, you're going to get the result you got in Wisconsin, right? All of a sudden, they'll come out for abortion. And what's the view on abortion in the United States? It's very interesting. Roughly speaking, for a long period of time, you've had two-thirds of the people thinking abortion is immoral and two thirds thinking it's a constitutional right. And so there are a bunch of people in the middle, a very large group, which says, we think it's immoral, but constitutionally protected. Well, that's the group uh, that essentially is going to doom the Republicans on this issue. And you know, I believe Justice Scalia when he said he didn't think about any of this stuff. Uh, he was just interested in whether or not it was coherent. But it's uh, this originalism, this prescription, it's a two-edged sword. You're not quite sure whether you want to respect it or not. So it's the single hardest question in any theory, whether it's constitutional law or any area of business. If you know you made a mistake at stage one and you come to stage two, do you ratify the previous mistake or do you try to undo it? And if so, how? That's the battle that you had to face. This sounds to me a lot like the classical debate within classical liber liberalism, libertarian thought between the natural rights camp and the utilitarian camp, right? So ah. you, have one, you have one side that makes the argument for liberty based on consequences and the other side that does it based on the, the individual rights of human beings. Yeah. In this in this case, we're talking about cut the Constitution and constitutional rights. Yeah, and it, it just seems to me that you we have a document, and we have a history where they didn't pass laws on immigration until the the middle of the eighteen hundreds, and yeah. those weren't strict. And then they had the, the Chinese Exclusion Act, but they really didn't ramp this thing up in, until later. There's a there's a very 
a strong argument to be made for the utility of allowing immigrants to come into the country. Mm -hmm. But the problem is that's a different argument. And the perception of a lot of people is that it's harmful. It's harmful to their jobs and it's harmful to their way of life. But regardless, in actuality, the history of America is one of allowing immigrants to come into the country. When you combine that with the fact that Article 1, Section 8, there's nothing in there that can even remotely be construed as giving Congress the power. So I just to then flip it and say, yes, but we have a history of doing the wrong thing. I say, so what? If it's a bad history, you get rid of it. But the main thing is this. My, My ultimate point is for the conservative who argues for originalism, He's hoisted on his own petard here because by an original interpretation, he's done or she's done because an original interpretation would not allow for that. Now, when you switch it over to utility and say, yes, but it's been embedded so long to undo it now would turn it to the states. And ultimately, then it would be the most liberal state would determine immigration law for the entire country. I get that. And it might very well be a mess, but it's a mess created by the founders when they enacted the document. And it's a mess created by the people who misinterpreted it. And you don't deeply, you don't further embed that mess by saying, okay, we're just going to allow it now, at least address the issue, push for an amendment, something. Okay. Let me start to respond to this. Uh, You start with the notion of natural law and it turns out that there was a, question of whether or not natural law and consequentialism, utilitarianism are similar or opposite. Uh, in 1989, in my first venture into the subject, I wrote an article called Utilitarian Foundations of Natural Law. And, and so, nice. I, well, and I try to go through this. I, I am by original training a Roman lawyer. It's, I'm one of the few people in the United States who still teaches it and actually knows something about what it is. And if you go back to their natural law, essentially the gap between utilitarianism and natural law stuff was much thinner than you might think today. The gap only started to take place sort of in the 18th century, where you get the Kantians on one side who tend to be deontologic, and then you get the consequentialists on the other side. And, you know, you try to figure out how it is. And I, I recently wrote a theoretical piece on the harm principle in the criminal law. And I said, look, uh, everybody to some extent is a consequentialist. Nobody believes in fiat justicia, ruat kailam, let justice be done though the heavens may fall. There are all sorts of things that you don't like to do to abridge individual autonomy, but we still allow for taxation to take in order to find preservation of our other goods and so forth. And so if you start looking to the uh, natural law tradition, the very early versions of it did not find the opposition that the later versions of this thing done. And what I did when I started to go back to the utilitarian foundations paper was to say that it was a good thing. Now, why do you then get per se oppositions to this? Well, it's a little bit tricky, but uh, what happens is there are many things that are subject, say, to the criminal law. Uh, some of them are like aggression against third parties. Some of them are offenses against morals, right? Blasphemy and so forth. Some of them are consensual behavior like uh, homosexual conduct or premarital sex of some kind or another. How do you think about that? Well, it turns out it the core libertarian offenses should be per se offenses in exactly the way in which you want them. It's not that we don't allow defenses in murder cases, but they have to be defenses based on on self-defense, necessity, defense of property, government orders or something of the sort. You simply cannot justify murder on the grounds I'd like to do it. All right, so you get all of this stuff in there. Well, why is it? Well, you start doing the utilitarian analysis, okay? And the first thing what you do is you try to make a rough comparison of the value lost to the victim as opposed to the value gained by the assailant. And that's not close. And then what you say is, well, is there anything that's going to flip this thing around? And say, well, what about third parties? And the answer is every third party is going to be terrorized if this could happen to them. And then you start looking at generalized public opinion and it all comes out the same way. So if you know that all three variables are lined up, making it a per se offense is extremely important because what it does is it means that you don't have to go through the whole deliberative calculus in each case. So to give you a real modern example of this, think of what the the dean said um, at Stanford, right? When she uh, 
essentially she went forward, you know, Jenny Martinez, and she went forward and she explained why she wasn't going to punish the students. Remember what she said? No, I don't, unfortunately. Well, look, I mean, it's, she wrote this, you know, crib but perfectly sensible account of the importance of free speech. Why counter speech in the English language does not include the power to shut somebody down unless you're heckling on Hyde Park Corner and so forth. And it's all wrong, wrong, wrong. She says, now, why don't I punish the students? She says, well, we, first of all, they make a hell of a mess there. And then Miss Terian Steinbach gets up there and she lectures the judge. And then she says, I defend free speech. And so Miss Martinez said is, you know, I can't punish these students because it wasn't made clear to them uh, that it was immoral for them to do what they did. And there's a maxim called in your, you know, ignorance of the law is no excuse. Ignorantia juris non excuse. And the reason you do that is you don't want people in murder's case to say, look, I know it's on the statutory book somewhere, but I didn't really know that it was immoral. And you just can't allow that. And so when these students come in and say, they don't know that it's right to not to abuse a speaker when they come in there, you don't even listen to it. Right? You just don't listen to it. But now you get regulatory crimes, mala prohibitors, they're called. And, you know, so the most famous case is a case called Lambert from many years ago, in which what you did, and it's a very hot topic, is somebody comes into Los Angeles, they're required to regulate, to register if they're a sexual offender or something of that sort, okay? And Justice Douglas said, you got to give these people notice. Now, why is that? Because you don't have to tell people that they're not supposed to kill. That's part of the everyday morality of our life, and we all understand it. But particular statutory offenses, if you don't have notice, it turns out they're just an arbitrary exercise of power. So what she does is she confuses the two cases. So the real importance of your natural law theory, and this is why I've always been a natural lawyer, okay, is that when it comes to categorical cases, it gives you categorical answers. But on the other hand, if you start thinking about gay rights and you start thinking about, well, is there a situation where there's mutual harms between the parties? Well, it's consensual. Uh, you always have to worry about whether people are abused or dragged into these relationships because of their being minors or defective. That's not the dominant problem here. Uh, so then the question is, well, there's a social convention against it, right, against the Bible, but that's broken down in many years. And so you start talking about how this works. And well, you know, to this day, there are homosexual couples who are disowned by their families, and there are homosexual couples who are welcomed into their families for every happy occasion that possibly takes place. So you can't find in the second tier any degree of uniformity. And in the third tier, what's happened is essentially in this country, uh, the categorical opposition to homosexuality has plummeted over the last 30 years. Um, most people taking the kind of view, it's not my business. These couples love each other and they can raise children. We don't want to put canards in their favor. 100% correct as far as I'm concerned. So what happens is you start looking at those three circles and the categorical offense that you had in the 19th century breaks down because you've got gains between the direct parties. Uh, indirect parties who do business with them are going to feel very differently about a couple that's gay as opposed to one person killing another person and then having bereaved family on the both sides. And the popular sentiment has changed. So what happens is with these various kinds of moral offenses, um, you are going to have to be extremely sensitive to changes in popular mood. Uh, changes in popular mood that do not hit the core libertarian offense. So there's just a completely different kind of human awareness, psychology, epistemology on these things. And you have to develop a doctrine of criminal law that accommodates, right? And so strong enough, after a while, the opposition is so fierce uh, that what you do is you find that things that the state was invited to regulate in the 19th century, it is essentially... Uh, barred from regulating the 20th century. So there is not the slightest bit of information anywhere in our history uh, that there would be a protected right to engage in prohibited sexual activities of a quote-unquote sinful nature. Um, you've gone through the history, right? It, no, no, and this, is, this actually is kind of my point. I'm very pro-gay marriage and very pro-gay rights. I don't then assume that those rights are embedded in the Constitution because, they they're, because they're not. But well, this is precisely what I'm talking about and what the conservatives do here and what liberals do as well, because they happen to favor something, they then read it into the Constitution. Well, I, I was not I was not doing that. No, no, not you. You're not the one. No, doing I, 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 no I, I do not want to be guilty of other people since what I was trying to say 
is that forget about the Constitution, the shift in popular sentiments on criminality, uh, various kinds of offenses like blasphemy or homosexuality are subject to a higher level of variance. And when cultural norms cease to be uniformly puritanical, uh, the system is going to collapse. Whereas the crime against murder, I don't care what your politics are going to be, you're going to see it and they're going to be at every level the direct participants, their immediate friends and associates and family, or the popular sentiment, they're always going to be uniform, so it's never going to change. The constitutional question is, how do we deal with these social changes, right? And, and what happened is, you know, the first thing is not at all clear that morals, well, fully understood at the time of the founding to be outside the power of regulation in the constitutional sense. Yeah. Um, because the reason was structural. Nobody thought, except in the territories, that the federal government had any power over these things. So they didn't debate it. It turns out in the territories, you do have to debate it. And there is a very complicated body of law which dealt with territorial rights before these places became states. Um, exactly what law do you apply and how do you start to apply it? So, uh, for example, it was well understood under the Commerce Clause in 1905 when they passed the Pure Food and Drug Act. Uh, that you had no power in the federal government to regulate the production of drugs inside the states. So the only thing you could do was to try to regulate their shipment across state lines, commerce cost, right? Yeah. But in the territories, there was no such prohibition. And so if you have the power of territorial rule, and you read that sensibly, that you can regulate production in this. By the time you get to 1939, we turn the Constitution upside down on the Commerce Clause. So the territories are no longer distinctive the way, the way they were under the original Constitution. Uh, no, I Look, I understand what you're saying. And, and uh, by and large, that rigidity is extremely useful going forward. Uh, but it's not useful, in my view, to deal with the massive social dislocations you're going to create. And now, if it's just a question of balance of convenience, I'm going to be like you. I'm going to say, you know, I'm not really sure whether this is the better law or the bad law. Do a seven year statute of limitations versus a 10 year statute of limitations? Give me a break. I can't figure this out. So let the legislation design. But I have no doubt whatsoever that if we done did Marbury and Madison and undid Hunt and against Hunter's Lise, change the laws with respect to the electoral college, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. This country would fall apart in a day. And you say, well, we'll do it by amendment. That's going to take you three years. And not only that, the danger is you'll get an amendment which is dumber than the original situation. So it's just a jurisprudence is a tricky business. My father told me when I was young, and I didn't quite understand the force of it. He said, son, there have to be times in your life where you learn to rise above principle." And what he meant by that is there are cases where the principal immigration points one way and the social consequences point the other way. For the most part, you stick with the principal, but in some very hard cases, you can. And that's why this whole thing boils down to a word that you must hate because it's so difficult. Judgment, right? The way you think of the Constitution, there is no judgment. It's this side of the line or that side of the line. What happens is we call judges judges for one reason because they're the ones who have to deal with the cases for which the categories break down. And they're not very good at it, some of them. Now, why are they not very good at it? Well, first of all, they don't know the originalist position, so they don't know what they're giving up, right? And the second thing is they don't understand the principles of prescription, so they don't understand what they're gaining. And third is that they do not have any consistent normative theory as to what the Constitution should be like. And my position is, you, I started off as a classical liberal, right? Talking in this. I said, this is what I do. When I see a series of changes uh, that implement classical liberal principles, and they've been around for a long time, I'm not going to upset them. But if I see a set of principles that offend classical liberal principles, I'm going to take them on, i.e. Jim Crow and segregation and so forth. Now, what do you do about abortion, right? Wow. Hold on, Professor Epstein. I'm a, we're out of time, so we can't. Uh, I can't get into abortion, but we didn't even get a chance to get into the the war on drugs. So I'm I'm going to invite you back. And, uh, well, and, we'll and, do and, some and, other time. And I hope you come back on because I, I've loved the discussion. Before we go, I just need a yes or no answer. According to the originalist, if you go by the original intent and meaning of the Constitution, was Congress authorized to pass immigration laws? Yeah, there was no. Okay. 
Thank you very much. Now, is there some place you want to send people? Do you have a website or anything where they can? Look oh, up? I, I'm, I'm sure. just uh, you just take care of it. OK. All right. Everybody just look yeah. up Professor Richard A. Epstein. Uh, you'll find all kinds of interesting articles and interesting things. Professor Epstein, it has been an absolute honor to have you on the show, and I can't wait to have you on again. Thank you very Hello. much. OK. For now, this is the Rational Egoist. I'll see you next time. Remember, like, share, and subscribe. Take care.